This week, a discussion on women who were artists and writers during the civil rights era. Simone was horrified by the 60th Street Baptist Church bombing of September 1963 in Birmingham, Alabama, which resulted in the deaths of four girls at choir practice, followed soon after by the murder of civil rights activist Medgar Evers in 1964 in Jackson, Mississippi, all of which prompted Simone to write her important call to action, a song about Mississippi and Alabama and the rest of the South, Mississippi Goddamn, which picked up on some of Martin Luther King's themes in his 1963 letter from Birmingham jail. Hear more with St. Joseph's University professor Catherine Sibley after this. Thank you so much for joining my class today at St. Joseph's University. Today, we're going to explore five women who use their writing and singing to create a better future for black people in our country. Polly Murray, Billie Holiday, Lorraine Hansberry, Nina Simone, and Anne Moody. Why choose these five women, you may ask? As writers, their work highlights a significant element of the civil rights movement. And it also broadens the more well-known narrative on the key participants from this time. Some of these women participated in sit-ins and other actions, to be sure. But even when their own work was very visible, such as Holiday's and Simone's songs, Hansberry's plays, and Moody's encounter at Woolworths, as we talked about last time, their full contribution to the civil rights struggle is not always widely appreciated. As those who have used the power of words, they are also a thread tying together the expanding protest of our time and of their era. Interestingly, too, all of them spent some time in New York City, echoing a theme first articulated in Harlem Renaissance novelist Jesse Redmond Fawcett's work, Plum Bun, as you remember, of New York as a place to start over, to live a freer, fuller life. These five, resisting the oppressive expectations of their time that they faced because of their race and gender, especially in small towns, thus chose to move in or near New York, especially when they were young. The causes our group embraced were essential for bringing rights for all people and include such areas as ending discrimination, what we might call today expanding equity and inclusion, underlining the equal treatment under law that the 14th Amendment guaranteed to all after the Civil War ended slavery, as well as more specifically promoting access to voting, juries, and education, working to end lynching of black men as well as rape of black women and dismantling discrimination in public accommodations, criminal justice, employment, housing, and cultural access. While many of us associate civil rights activism with men like Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, and feminist activism with women like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, Betty Friedan, and Gloria Steinem, such activism needs to be disentangled from these gendered and racialized expectations Black women, you can kind of see them in the background in that picture, right? Black women, and especially the writers here, made significant efforts that were just as important. And their story helps balance an often male-centered, white-centered narrative. We'll begin our story with Polly Murray, the first of the five to be born in 1910. She plays a major role in our story here, both because of the long history of her activism and because of the range of it, both before and after World War II. Anne Moody will conclude our talk. She died most recently in 2015. Anna Pauline Polly Murray was born in Baltimore and orphaned when she was four. She was raised by her aunts and grandparents in Durham, North Carolina. Polly, as she would later call herself, would promote women's rights and black people's rights and was instrumental in changing laws for both. She went north to college in New York, but it being the Depression, she struggled to stay in. Still, she graduated, and in 1933, she also met Eleanor Roosevelt at a camp for unemployed women, or it may have been shortly after 1933 that she met her. They stayed friends for life. And isn't that cute? She, she, she camp, right? Like C, C, C. Anyway, you knew that at least one first lady was going to come up today, didn't you, class? Yes. Well aware that she was the granddaughter of an enslaved woman and the great-great-granddaughter of a slaveholder, Polly (laughs) 
in her own body represented the systematic practice of white men's rape of black women that earlier activists like Ida B. Wells had alluded to in her critique of lynching. Wells, of course, is another earlier example of black women who wrote to emancipate. She laid the groundwork for the women we profile today. In 1919, her work to expose the truth about a race massacre even less known than the Tulsa massacre of 1921 that we spoke about, this one in Elaine, Arkansas in 1919, led the FBI to target her as a dangerous subversive, as you can see on the slide, one of the most dangerous, as you can see here. To further her activism, Polly Murray wanted to get a law degree, but faced many obstacles as a black woman. In the 1930s, she attempted to enroll at the University of North Carolina, where one of her white ancestors, James Strudwick Smith, had once been on the board of trustees. Smith was the grandfather of Polly's grandmother, Cornelia Smith. But North Carolina would not budge. There she is. Grandmother Cornelia's birth to one of Smith's enslaved women, Harriet, who had been raped by his son, Sidney Smith, was an outcome recently remarked upon by Caroline Randall in her brilliant article, My Body is a Confederate Monument, that we read in class, where she wrote, I am the descendant of black women who were domestic servants and white men who raped their help, unquote. She continues, quote, what is a monument but a standing memory, an artifact made tangible? My body and blood are a tangible truth of the South and its past. I don't just come from the South. I come from Confederates. With a rejection from North Carolina because of her race, Polly went to Howard University instead, where she was tops in her class, finishing her law degree there, something which typically netted a scholarship to Harvard University. But this, too, was refused. Do you remember why we mentioned this in class? She was a woman. She was a woman, right. So first it's her race, and now it's her sex. Yes. Polly wrote to the committee at Harvard, gentlemen, I would gladly change my sex to meet your requirements. But since the way to such change has not yet been revealed to me, I have no recourse but to appeal to you to change your minds. Well, she was not successful. While at Howard... She coined the term Jane Crow to underline the kind of discrimination she faced. Today, using Kimberly Crenshaw's term, we would call this situation intersectionality. Adding to the complexity, and certainly against the cultural norms of her era, Polly sometimes dressed in men's clothes, and her gender fluidity would be something that shaped her entire life at a time when there was barely the vocabulary for it. In 1940, she was arrested for refusing to sit in the back of a bus in Virginia, well ahead of Rosa Parks and even Jackie Robinson, who was court-martialed himself for standing up to segregation at Fort Hood in 1944. A believer in civil disobedience, Murray also participated in restaurant sit-ins in the early 1940s and led a national campaign on behalf of a black sharecropper, Odell Waller, who was executed for killing his landlord in self-defense in 1942. She and Eleanor Roosevelt both made passionate pitches on Waller's behalf. Shortly after World War II, she joined the Congress on Racial Equality on an integrated journey of reconciliation, an early freedom ride, if you like. She also set up a law practice in New York, and her work led her to a thorough review of many state laws on discrimination, culminating in her voluminous state's laws on race and color. Interestingly, she was invited to do this by the Methodist Church, who wanted to you know, understand policies around the country, and so that was really one of her first big uh, contracts there. Thurgood Marshall referred to this work as the Bible that lay behind his arguments in the landmark desegregation case Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. By the way, he also relied on one of her papers from law school that Polly had written to point out how discrimination was a badge of inferiority for black students. You may remember these uh, studies of dolls, right, that were used in that, in that case. In 1956, Polly was hired by the firm Paul Weiss. While there, she also published her family's history, Proud Shoes, highlighting the role of her enslaved ancestors. And she wrote poetry as well. She met Irene Barlow at the firm. Irene, Irene sorry, became her romantic partner until Barlow died in 1976. 
So I wanted to ask if you had any reactions to her uh, poem that you had for today, uh, Hope is a Song in a Weary Throat. Did anything come up for you when you read that poem? Anything that Polly was talking about? I mean, she wrote that a little bit later, so we were around 1970 or so. But I wondered if anyone wanted to comment on the poem, uh, Hope is a Song in a Weary Throat, what she was hoping for, what she referred to. Any thoughts about the song? Yes, thank you, Sarah. Um, I think that it was it had a very sad tone, but yet through all of her struggles and the things she overcame, she still held on to hope. Yes, yes, exactly. Do you remember some of the some of the things that she singled out there? I mean, it was almost like she was talking about the history of African Americans, right? She went, you know, even back toward the Civil War days and I don't know if anyone wants to go. Go ahead, please. Yeah. She said, hope is a bird's wing. Yeah, right, exactly. And she mentioned the, the 40 acres and a mule and some of the other things, too, right, that people had been asking for for a long time. And I love, can you read us just the last line about the, I think, the, or the last little couplet there? It's beautiful. I'm, I'm oh, coming. you don't have it? I have it in front of me here. I think I can give it to you. Or I can give it to someone else who might like a turn. Um, the last two lines, if you'd like to. Last Give me a, yeah, thank you. Give me a song of hope and love and a brown girl's heart to hear it. Yeah, isn't that lovely? So she was so, um, she was so evocative in her writing, right? Thank you so much. Okay, so these reactions then will help us see how many-sided her writing was. She was a she was a lawyer, right? She was a poet. She was a, a, a biographer of her own family, right? On and on and on. Like several in our group, Murray was interested in Pan-Africanism and went to teach law in Ghana in 1960-61. Upon her return, she was appointed to the Kennedy administration's commission on the status of women's committee, uh, the status, her, actually, it's a complicated name, the Co- Committee on the Status of Women, and they had their own committee on civil and political rights. While she continued to press the point that women so active on the ground were left out of too many roles in the leadership of the civil rights movement. So we've been studying in our course so many women who are active on the ground. Some of the women named right in our book, um, uh, The Dark End of the Street, or, of course, Ann Moody and others. So in 1963, she wrote The Negro Woman in the Quest for Equality, and she pointed out to civil rights leader A. Philip Randolph, who was here at the March on Washington, that no women were invited to make a major speech or be part of the delegation of leaders who went to the White House that day in August of 1963. So I wondered if anyone had any thoughts about that. Were you struck by that? Yes, Abra. Yeah, so this reminds me of how um, black women were not, like, really included in um, women's suffrage because the white women were trying to appeal to the people in power who were, like, in these institutions that were, you know, white men. And so for their already, like their gender was making it harder for them to make their case. Yes. So if you add uh, an oppressed gender and an oppressed race, so black women, yes. they're not going to get, it's not going to be listened to as much, unfortunately. Exactly. These, these men seem to think, you know, they had it under control. They were not going to bring in the women, despite the fact that women were doing all this work. Yeah, Julia. I think that women are an integral part of history, and yeah. they're often ignored, but I think it's so important that usually when you see strong men at the front of these movements and um like these marches it's usually due to the fact that like the women is also in the home creating the strong environment for them taking care of the children feeding them when they come home giving them a home over their heads so i think they're so integral in that way and i think at the very least for that they deserve room to speak because like there's the phrase like behind every strong man is an even stronger woman so i think it's like something like that where they also deserve recognition for kind of the basis of what all these men are doing exactly yeah damaris i just going off julia's point i just thought women weren't seen as leaders like those black women were not seen as leaders that's why they didn't want them to be involved at all they saw them as helpers Exactly. And it is true that the work they were doing was invaluable and leadership, but yes. the, it just was, it was undervalued work 
because it was women's women's work right. and I just feel like that's the reason they were so often ignored or not right. seen as leaders even right. though they were doing leadership work yes exactly very very good point right all the things that you're saying I think exactly help explain you know this this rather important uh, gap here yeah so in 1964 Polly Murray helped prepare a legal brief to argue that sex along with race should be included in the Civil Rights Act of 1964 as it was and she soon helped launch the National Organization for Women with Betty Friedan and others Although later black feminists, as you may know, found such groups generally not always as um, hopeful, helpful and hospitable as they had hoped. Murray graduated with her doctorate of laws, first black woman to do so at Yale in 1965. Later, she had a school name for her, as you may know. She also, or I'm sorry, not a, yeah, a, it's called a college there, a residential college. She also published Jane Crow and the Law, Sex Discrimination and Title VII, comparing the discrimination against women to the Jim Crow discrimination, as you've been pointing out, against women um, as, as well. And she argued to end discrimination against women in juries and uh, as you may know, Jim Crow had left many women out of juries and, of course, many men as well, uh, people of color in general, because they were not on the voting ranks, right? So they were left out of juries in those days. So Ruth Bader Ginsburg later credited Murray and her fellow attorneys who had helped her when presenting herself, Ginsburg, another gender discrimination case in front of the Supreme Court in 1971. We're standing on their shoulders, she explained. We're saying the same things they said, but now at last society is ready to listen. Now, as you can see here, Murray was later the first black woman ordained a priest by the Episcopal Church in 1976. She gave communion at the same church in North Carolina where her grandmother, the then enslaved Cornelia, had been baptized in 1954. I'm sorry, 1854, pardon me. All the strands of my life had come together, she recalled. Descendant of slave and of slave owner. Now I was empowered to minister the sacrament of one in whom there is no North or South, no black or white, no male or female. In 2010, 25 years after her death, Polly Murray officially became an Episcopal saint. Now, while Polly was in college in the 1930s, a horrific spectacle lynching occurred in Marion, Indiana, the murder of Thomas Shipp and Abram Smith. A school teacher in the Bronx named Abe Mirapol saw the widely circulated picture of this horrific event and threw his outrage and sad sadness into a poem called Strange Fruit, which he then put to music. He also, by the way, later adopted the children of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, as you may know, when their parents were executed. Billie Holiday, of course, made the song famous as her best-selling recording and one she sang for 20 years. She recalled that her father had been denied medical treatment because of his race, something still happening, as she would note, in the 1950s, when, as well, lynchings like that of Emmett Till were also sadly still occurring. So I'm just going to play you a little bit of this song. Blood on the leaves and blood at the road. Black bodies swinging in the southern breeze. Strange fruit hanging from the poplar tree. Holiday, who had been born, such an emotionally moving song, isn't it, to hear, and I'm so glad we had a chance to play it for you. You should listen to the whole song, though, when you have a chance. Born in Philadelphia in 1915 and singing in Harlem by the time she was a teenager, had a rocky childhood, but the renown of Strange Fruit set her up for a successful career through the 40s and beyond. Like Murray, Holiday too, had relationships with women and men. Sadly, her promise was cut short by many personal challenges, including struggles with drugs and alcohol, and she died of cirrhosis at a New York hospital at only 44 in 1959. Meanwhile, that very year, playwright Lorraine Hansberry mounted her play, A Raisin in the Sun, the first one ever written by an African-American woman to appear on Broadway. Class, do you recall where the title came from, from some of our previous discussions? Yes, Lizzie? Um, the Langston Hughes poem. Yes, which was called... We're starting Harlem, right? 
Yeah, I think, or a dream deferred, I think was the one. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much. Wonderful. This, um, this play was based on her family's own experiences. Her father had faced racial covenants against his purchase of a home in Washington Park, Chicago. It then became a Supreme Court case, Hansbury versus Lee in 1940. Lorraine always said that her father, who died when she was 15, had been killed by American racism. The play concerns housing discrimination, but also pan-Africanism. At that moment, when Africans were tearing down imperialism, Hansberry was equally interested in U.S. civil rights and freedom for Africans from colonialism. Her activism had first emerged at the University of Wisconsin, where she integrated a dorm and joined the Communist Party, becoming active in the cause of Willie McGee, a black man sentenced to death in 1951 for having a relationship with a white woman. Does anyone want to share anything about that poem, which was called Lynch Song? Um, and I have it here if there's anything you want to, or actually it might still be there. Thank you. Um, if anyone wants to cite anything interesting from that poem that struck them. She wrote the poem in 1951. Yes, Damaris. I, I just thought I liked when she was talking, because she uses like dark nights. And then at the, like near the, I guess the middle of the end, she talks about like white faces in the dark nights. Yes. And I just think even if it's just words, like the contrast of like dark and white was just really, yes. I don't know, touching in her, in her, um, right. in her a poem about lynching. And she was so young when she wrote that poem and so young when she was an activist in this way. Now, her work, I should add, like Ida B. Wells, elicited the interest of the FBI. um, Because, of course, you know, she had joined the Communist Party. And especially when she went to Montevideo for a peace conference in 1952, taking the place of Paul Robeson, who had been denied a passport by the State Department at that time to go to the same conference. So she went instead. Now, she married in 1953, but she was a closeted lesbian, and she later divorced her husband. She would continue her activism on many fronts until her death, very premature death, from pancreatic cancer in 1965. Before she died, Hansberry had become friends with Nina Simone, a neighbor of hers in Mount Vernon, New York, a suburb of New York City. And indeed, she inspired Simone to activism. Born in 1933 to a poor family in Tryon, North Carolina, Nina Simone's talents as a singer and pianist were soon apparent. She was a prodigy, and her hometown friends helped get her to Juilliard as a child. Later, in 1951, she auditioned at the Curtis Institute in Philadelphia, but was rejected. She was sure because of her race, but apparently only three of the 72 applicants were taken that year, as we have mentioned. She then turned to singing in nightclubs in Atlantic City and eventually found success with I Loves You, Porgy, which Billie Holiday had made famous. She was conflicted about this, still seeing herself as a classical musician and not a jazz performer, but it became a top 20 hit. Settling down with her husband and becoming a mother and meeting Hansberry too, Simone was horrified by the 60th Street Baptist Church bombing of September 1963 in Birmingham, Alabama, which resulted in the deaths of four girls at choir practice, followed soon after by the murder of civil rights activist Medgar Evers in 1964 in Jackson, Mississippi, all of which prompted Simone to write her important call to action, a song about Mississippi and Alabama and the rest of the South, Mississippi Goddamn, which picked up on some of Martin Luther King's themes in his 1963 letter for Birmingham jail. This is a very famous letter. I'm sure you have heard of it, but I wanted to just highlight the uh, emphasis he puts here on the word wait, right? How you must wait, how you must be slow. And of course, he is disagreeing with the ministers, mostly the white ministers of Birmingham who are telling him to wait before integration. And he's saying, for years now, I've heard this word. This wait has almost always meant never. It has been a tranquilizing thalidomide. Remember, that was a a pill they gave to uh, mothers in those days, which led to horrible birth defects. Relieving the emotional stress for a moment, only to give birth to an all in, I'm sorry, an ill-formed infant of frustration. Justice too long delayed is justice denied. And again, the Pan-African reference, right? The nations of Asia and Africa are moving with jet-like speed toward the goal of political independence. And we still creep at horse and buggy pace toward the gaining of a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. So this theme of gradualism and going slow was also pilloried by Simone in her song, which starts like this. Um, And then I'm going to play you a little clip from it. 
but you can see um, how it builds here. And there's the record uh, from the old days. I understand vinyl is coming back. Um, anyway, you can see, right? I'll, uh, did anyone want to read the, um, the words that they see here? Somebody want to jump in? Aiden, do you want to read maybe the first couple of stanzas? Uh, sure. Um, Alabama's gotten me so upset. Tennessee made me lose my rest. And everybody knows about Mississippi goddamn. Uh, can't you see it? Can't you feel it? It's all in the air. I can't stand the pressure much longer. Somebody say a prayer. Good. Anyone want to follow up on that? Yes, Kevin. Hound dogs on my trail. School children sitting in jail. Black cat cross my path. I think every day is going to be my last. Lord have mercy on this land of mine. We all going to get it in due time. I don't belong here. I don't belong there. I've even stopped believing in prayer. Don't tell me, I tell you. Thank you. And now, this is where that picks up. Don't tell me, I'll tell you. Me and my people just about do. I've been there, so I know they keep on saying, go slow. So you hear the theme, right? That's just the trouble. Too slow. Washing the wind. She, uh, she does a very good job there, I think, of picking up on that theme of uh, Martin Luther King. Oh, sorry. Then, in 1965, alongside Sammy Davis Jr., Mahalia Jackson, Harry Belafonte, and Joan Baez, Simone sang at the Stars for Freedom rally, which accompanied the famous March for Voting Rights from Selma to Montgomery. In 1966, she wrote a poem called Four Women, which was later made into a song, as a tribute to the Birmingham girls who had been killed. Her four women in the song were purposefully stereotypes. She noted, in order to underline how white America made black women invisible, she hoped to spur her black sisters to control their own destinies. Until they had the confidence, she said, to define themselves, they'd be stuck in the same mess forever. And I wondered if any of the students wanted to say anything about either of the songs, because you also have the four women song in front of you, uh, or did have, um, you could pass it around. Yeah, Julia. Well, the whole, like, too slow narrative kind of brings me back to the beginning of the semester when we were talking about Booker T. Washington and how his suggestion of gaining more traction for civil rights was to go slow like he kind of said like accept the smaller victories and have it contribute to a bigger picture so it's interesting how there's so many um contradicting views within the same subject and i think it's really interesting to kind of pick apart um how different people saw the means to an end right exactly and of course it's a good point you're making too because it wasn't only the white ministers who were saying go slow uh, you know a number of black leaders were also too slow for martin luther king and others right thank you katie did you want to add something to that no okay or abra did you um i just had some thoughts on her song for women which yes. um uh and like nina simone in general so yeah that song's definitely like i think i her acknowledging like the stereotyping is also like empowering and like it because like stereotypes exists for a reason and it's like recognizing that like pe women being put in these boxes is like like she knows what that's like and um and like giving it a platform to like sharing that art with like the rest of the world around it and then like I think Nina Simone too we still see in culture today like she sampled a lot in rap music by like um Oh, yes. Black artist today, so like up. she's very um, relevant to yeah. today as well. In your presentation, I yes. think, yeah, thank you, great, thank you, very, very good points, very helpful, exactly. I think you know, exposing the stereotypes can help to demolish them. So her next activist album was to honor Martin Luther King after his assassination in 1968, when she wrote, "The King of Love is Dead." Soon after, though, she gave up on activism. She blamed the music industry for turning on her for her protest songs and mostly lived abroad, sadly plagued by a number of financial and health challenges until her death in 2003. The year that Simone released her King album, 1968, was the same year that Ann Moody wrote Coming of Age in Mississippi, which, of course, we've been reading in class this week. Her memoir of growing up poor and black under Jim Crow and becoming an activist for civil rights. As a girl, Ann had worked 
as you know, to help her struggling family by cleaning and babysitting for white women, many of whom treated her with disdain or worse, while they attended meetings to assure white supremacy. Meanwhile, her mother quaked in fear to even comment on such events as the horrific murder of Emmett Till, which we've mentioned already today, in 1955, and other depredations against black people in Centerville itself when Anne would ask her mother about them. Jackie Robinson pointed to the same fear in a letter he wrote about Anne in 1964. Anne literally could not go home. Anne, of course, had been happy to leave her oppressive town. An excellent student, she got a basketball scholarship and eventually graduated from Tougaloo College. There, she joined the NAACP and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, also known as SNCC, and among many other actions, take, took part in the sit-in in 1963 at the Woolworths in Jackson, Mississippi, which you have seen this picture already in class. I didn't know if you'd seen that one, which is um, Memphis Norman, one of the other young men who was with them, uh, and he was you know, almost killed in that moment. It was an extremely tense and dangerous three hours in which this man almost died. She was, of course, horrifically treated with all kinds of disgusting items being poured on her, and so was her friend Joan Trumpower and her teacher, John Salter. He also was viciously attacked with brass knuckles, a, a very a bloody attack there. The police were outside, many of them, but did nothing to intervene. So I wanted to ask you, since you have looked at this and we've talked about this, anything you want to say about why this is so significant, why this, this moment, and, and of course there were many other moments like this, so I certainly Anne was not alone in doing these kinds of things, but uh, anyone want to comment about that? What strikes you about this? Why was this moment so important? And of course the next year, right, the, the, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 ended this kind of discrimination and accommodation, but does anyone want to, yeah, Julia? Well, something that I'm just kind of noticing now about the picture is that they're all men all white men so i think it's interesting, interesting to it? look at it not only from a racial perspective but also um from a male versus female perspective it looks like in this picture specifically it the is females striking. now the i don't know if that's if that's the whole picture it could have been that the women were in the back and maybe men had pushed them out of the way or i'm not really sure because certainly yeah, we've seen plenty of women at the, about at the about. forefront of the attack yes. i'm saying is all white men so it's interesting to see um not only the gender discrimination but also the racial discrimination yeah. all in one setting it's very striking it's certainly very striking thank you would anyone else like to comment yes I was just going to say it probably took a lot of strength not to move at all and never get up and just sit there. And I feel like in doing that, you definitely show how trivial the hate is that you're receiving because you're just trying to get a cup of coffee, like Martin Luther King said. And then people are like pouring things on you and harassing you, throwing on the ground and beating you up like they look like the crazy people. So I get why, but I do feel like the amount of resilience that has to go into just letting people pour sugar, salt, and ketchup and yelp obscenities at you and dehumanize you is probably way more than I could be doing. Right, right. I think most of us. And one of the themes that was raised, remember in our little video we saw um, Joan Trumpower looking back, a much older woman now, um, referring to the fact that, you know, they were just average people and they did this, right? They were not Martin Luther King. They were not Rosa Parks. They were just average people. They put themselves in this position, hoping, you know, to kind of wake people up a little bit. And of course, they built on the work that so many others had done up until that point, including the Tougaloo Nine, right, who were at the library in Tougaloo trying to integrate it just a couple of years earlier. But Ada, were you going to say something? Yeah, I also just think it's important in showing, like, the sort of um, reactions that people would get out of, like, nonviolent uh, demonstrations. Yes. And I think that they saw the use of nonviolent demonstrations as, like, a positive way or, like, a powerful way to get their message across because they knew that if they were to act out and, like, turn around and hit someone who threw coffee at them, they knew, like, they wouldn't get anywhere with that because right. the, um, the legal system at the time wouldn't allow that. I mean, they, they, right, they might have been even worse treated, right? But, of course, even when not fighting, they were horribly treated. Yeah, Julia. Yeah, just to add on to what um, Damaris said, like, it really does highlight the amount of racism and hatred in these people's hearts because, like, we touched on the other day, most, if not all, of these men probably have jobs, families, school to attend. They could have been doing anything else other than 
bothering innocent people who are just trying to enjoy a meal in their own free time. It's really just unnecessary and cruel. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And she comments about that. That's well, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, we, we know about scenes like this. We've seen these pictures. Uh, but what's striking, I think, is that we have her memoir as well, where she talks about being in the middle of it and what it was like and the, the sickness of this, this hatred, right, that she felt. Exactly. And it's so, I think, revealing and important to understand and see that. So I'm very, um, very glad that you brought up that the point because we see it from the inside because of her memoir. And again, that brings back our theme of the writing. The writing is emancipation, right? Yeah, Sarah. I think that this event that she organized was especially significant because she didn't have support from her family. And it's not that they didn't want to support her, but they just felt like they couldn't raise their voice in their hometown. Just they didn't want to face any backlash. So I think it's that especially highlights the the racial tensions in her hometown. Um, yet she was so brave and organized this through her college. Right, exactly. She And as Jackie Robinson said, right, she, she could not go home because she would be attacked. Um, and her own family, right, was so afraid of, of these things. So thank you uh, for raising that point. Now, in 1964, she was part of that large army of registr- registering uh, activists, right, who went around to try to get people to vote. And you'll recall this in the book. It's a little bit um, later on uh, from where we were just uh, the other day. But she is, this is in a town called Canton, Mississippi. And she's going in. And wh- one of the things that she really highlights here is really exactly what you're all referring to, is the fear. The fear that these people had about signing up to vote because they were afraid something would happen to them if they signed up. They're constantly confronted with. Uh, they, meaning the, her, the, the registrants, right, who are trying to register people to vote, are constantly confronted with the fear of the white man. More in Madison, here in Madison County, uh, this seems an everlasting fear. So we have to remember that just two years later, the Voting Rights Act was passed, but would that have happened without this kind of on the ground, painful, really dangerous, right? We know people died doing this, right, in 1964. So uh, she was, uh, she had left uh, in 1964, she went to New York, but she was in the middle of this. And I just thought, this is a separate issue. This is a protest at a high school in Canton. But I just thought it was interesting to kind of put those together to see how difficult life was for um, African Americans living in Canton, uh, whether they were in school or trying to vote, right? It was a very, uh, really a very, very difficult time. So one of the things she said about her work, uh, even though her family, as you say, Sarah, was targeted and she was targeted by the KKK, she said this effort gave her life fuller dimension. Quote, something happened to me as I got more and more involved in the movement. I had found something outside myself that gave meaning to my life. So it was, though, a kind of a thing that could really exhaust you, right? So she does move to New York in 1964. She lives a quiet life there. She writes her memoir a few years later. Eventually, she moved back to Mississippi, where she died in 2015. And just two years ago, she was honored in Centerville, of all places, right, by uh, these uh, people who came together. And this is actually mostly her family members here. You remember Adeline in the book? Uh, that's, that's Adeline, her sister and her brother. Um, they came together and and the city, or I think the highway department, honored her, I guess, with a, um, a highway segment in Centerville there and Moody Memorial Highway. So I thought that was kind of a nice tribute. Um, I just have a, yes, please. I, 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 I just have a question about the, uh, about, the, about the last photo. Yes. When they were doing the... Uh, when they were doing the, the highway uh, one, the, yeah. the uh, memorial for yeah. her, I, 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 I did notice that in the background, I thought I saw the uh, Confederate back. flag in the background. Yeah. I think that that's the Mississippi state flag. Oh, oh. Just oh yes, that flag in the back. It's yes, that yes. It's from 2015. Let's see if I can. <laughs> right. I wondered about that. <laughs> I know. Good, good, good spotted. Yeah, I, I don't know. In 2015, yeah, that's an interesting question. Perhaps that was, uh, so they, they only changed their flag very recently, right? Didn't we talk about this? Yeah, that's sort of an ironic piece, if that is the case. Thank you for noticing. Okay, I just have one more slide to show you because we are, we are about to conclude. I have to just move to that. There we are. There they all are again, right? 
Not long before her death in 1965, Lorraine Hansberry underlined the importance of her own creative impulse when she met with several young black writers, telling them, though it is a thrilling and marvelous thing to be merely young and gifted in such a time, because remember, it was a time of great activism, a lot going on, it is doubly so, doubly dynamic to be young, gifted, and black. And this phrase, too, became a song that Nina Simone would record in 1969 uh, as one of her final civil rights recordings. As this lecture has noted, all of these women were at various times young, gifted, and black. And with their creativity and their music, their writing talent and their activism, all building on the work of each other and sometimes directly with each other, they broadened opportunities for so many with their poetry, their lyrics, their literature, their memoir, and their legal arguments. They used writing to emancipate, thus leaving an important record of their activism that we can continue to explore. Even though both Billie Holiday and Lorraine Hansberry died much too young, and Nina Simone stopped singing songs of activism and moved abroad, and Anne Moody became kind of burned out on change, you may remember at the end of her book, she says, we shall overcome? Well, maybe, will we? Wondering about that. The important breakthroughs their writing and activism made possible, including the legal challenges laid down firmly and securely by Polly Murray, all speak to their lasting contributions. Thank you all so very much. Thank you. You are wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures and History podcast. For more civil rights history, check out our Presidential Recordings podcast. Go behind the scenes with privately recorded phone calls between President Lyndon Johnson, members of Congress, and civil rights leaders, including Martin Luther King Jr. Find it wherever you listen to podcasts.